Satire. Not to be mistaken for the USA Tire Company on Bill Gaines' Zeppelin. Satire. By the Wrong Hero. Produced by Francis Domeno. A man who bears a certain sneaking, suspicious likeliness to the wrong hero. Hi, I'm the wrong hero. And today we're presenting part nine of our 10 part series on humor and comedy in the American tradition. This is perhaps the most significant chapter, at least as far as I'm concerned, insofar as my area of expertise extends in a wide ranging arc from the beginnings of American comedy to its inevitable conclusion in the present day. And that section is satire. And I'd like to, first of all, quote from Tony Hendra's book um, called, called Going Too Far, because he has some very prescient things to say um, about satire. And he uh, draws the distinction between classic satire and, um, and modern day satire. And um, let's see if I can find this particular portion here. Um, well, let's just say that Hendra states that when social fundamentals are widely Held to have been seriously departed from, satire will flourish. For better or worse, the satire is the, the satirist is the most morally active of the various types of comedic artisans. Where others get laughs making themselves ludicrous or by creating mayhem around them, the satirist gets his by mocking the betrayal of principles. Now he goes on to uh, make a distinction. He says, Unlike national and ethnic versions, domestic stereotypes often serve as models for the very people they are aimed at. When stereotype and reality start to become confused, the ultimate aim of propaganda, the damage in human terms, begins. It is a function, perhaps the function, of satire to draw attention to this discrepancy. Unlike ridicule, which repeats and reconfirms stereotypes, satire seeks to destroy them. Satire's job is to remind people that stereotypes and reality just won't mix. It does this by taking on, imitating, the character, behavior, language, even the supposed thought process of the stereotype, and demonstrating the absurd gap between it and the real world. Satire, of course, can no more prevent people's needs for stereotypes than could legislation, but it is a necessary antidote. Where ridicule dehumanizes, satire rehumanizes. People need to make rules, but they also need to acknowledge exceptions. Humor, in general, to an extent we all recognize but are rarely considered, is the principal social glue that holds this stasis together. Now, earlier I said that um, he drew a distinction between classical satire, which is profoundly conservative and attacks things not as they are, but as they are meant to be and are not. And modern day satire, which shades closer into parody in that it makes its satirical points by imitating the language of, let's call it, the oppressive. Now, Amy Walden says that it's easier to entertain than it is to educate. Well, satire, in its essence, seeks to do both. Representational satire has more capacity than political commentary to relieve the pressures of a fractious age. Saul Bellow defines ideology as not thinking for oneself, a system of false thinking and non-truth that can lead to obedience and conformity. Now, one time uh, in some weekly journal, perhaps it was the Boston Phoenix, I saw a reference to affectionate satire. This, to me, is an oxymoron. To quote Scott McLennie, satire is often driven by bitterness of an almost delirious sort, lapsing at times into cruelty. Satire, in its classical form, is basically a conservative impulse, but even as recent, as, uh, as long ago as uh, Jonathan Swift um, in his uh, um, 
a modest proposal, um, we see that by mocking the language of the bureaucrat, one can make one's satirical points, uh, which of course are sometimes lost in translation, particularly if the people reading these, um, these things aren't particularly attuned to the notion that they might be satirical in intent. It is a truism for our time, says Amos Blood, that the power of satire to ridicule folly and humbug lags behind the power of folly and humbug to pretend that they are not ridiculous at all. Parody falls short of reality. Now, Emily Dickinson um, put forth a credo in one of her verses which um, could serve as the credo for satirists everywhere. Tell the truth, but tell it slant. The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. And this, of course, is a uh, watchword for the 20th century, even though she wrote it in the 19th century. Of course, we're fast approaching the 21st century. Conservatives are wittier than liberals, says Clifton Fadiman, because their freedom from earnestness gives them a deft touch. This sort of relates to yet another citation that was to be found in Tony Henry's 1987 book, Going Too Far, um, in which uh, the person who uh, helped bring Animal House to the screen said that, um, I've always felt it was impossible to be both politically correct and get anything done. Now this is not intended as an attack on political correctness, but um, I should point out that uh, satire leaves none of its targets immune to criticism, including political correctness. Feigned ignorance is the root of all satire. This act, the false and lying narrator, um, which, who pretends to be naive, uh, but in fact is knowing, and uses this knowingness to create an ir a ironic facade. Uh, ignorance is the mother of improvisation, says Norma Meacock um, in a related theme. Satire is not a license to lie, says Craig Varoga, drawing, drawing a very valuable distinction between satire and propaganda. Jackie Mason uh, is an example of somebody who started out as an ethnic comedian and has uh, blossomed, so to speak, into a satirist. Um, like all earnest people, John Steinbeck had an aversion to satirists, says Florence King. Of course, John Steinbeck wrote a great many novels of political um, grounding. Of course, he went from being a liberal in the 30s to something of a conservative in the 60s. John Lawrence, speaking of Jackie Mason, states, Jokes don't kill people. What they kill is certainty, and activists can never forgive funny men for this. To those hungry for progress, Doubt is as welcome as modesty in a whore, but while faith is nice, doubt gets you an education. And that is another credo of satire, which we might do well remember. While faith is nice, doubt gets you an education. Any authentic comedian's cause is intellectual freedom, John Lahr goes on to say. All genuine comedy is politically incorrect. Challenging assumptions, testing limits, crossing boundaries, disabusing the public of its most firmly held beliefs. That, in um, essence, is what satire is. Now, uh, John Laura also talks of Mort Sahl, who started out in the 1950s. Uh, he was one of the uh, perhaps less than heralded uh, creators and innovators of a modern style of comedy which spanned from approximately 1975 to roughly the early 1980s. Uh, Tony Hendrick calls it boomer humor. And but what he means by this is a satirical humor which is is not neither ideologically left nor right, but basically takes as its premise the uh, the notion that um, things are not as they seem. That's what um, Jim Thompson the novelist said was the basic plot, not the 31 plots, just that one basic plot. Things are not as they seem. Anyway, uh, John Lawrence says of more Saul, Saul is sharply intelligent but too witty to be vulgar, and this 
too bad. He doesn't punch the heart of the audience so much as flatter its head. Well, there, there are worse things, of course, to uh, be known for. An intellectual in showbiz is like the smartest bear at the zoo, says Mort Sal. Comedians are out to lunch. They think comedy is to help you escape from the truth rather than to highlight it. And of course, this is a profoundly satirical point of view. In fact, um, the words satire and truthfulness are very closely linked, even though one, of course, is a abstract and the other is a method, an abstract concept, and the other is a method or a methodology. One day I realized, says Eric Bogosian, that if I was willing to not be afraid of the demons in my mind, I could be more forward. And again, again and again, in fact, we get to this point to be made about comedy, that it arises from some hurt, some disappointment in one's life. Um, Bob Newhart said that comedy was the only thing that kept him sane. It was his way of fighting back. We are the heroes in our own lives who must encounter our own villains along the way, says M. L. Travers. And that, again, is another essential point behind wishing to create comedy, and in particular, satirical comedy. A shrewd merchandising of contemporary obsessions, says Stephen Kantzler, referring to satire. Satire is a parasite, rarely stronger than its host. Says Stephen Kantzler, I'm not quite sure I agree. I would think, if anything, what he was discussing here is parody. The wrong hero, of course, is a parody of a superhero, since he has no powers except the power to drone on interminably boring people, perhaps into a state of stupefied weakness, which enables the wrong hero to have his will with them. Um, the style of laughter, the subject may be a cause for tears, says Kenneth Coach, um, one of my favorite poets, incidentally, and um, along with Edward Dorn. And incidentally, um, the style is laughter, the subject may be a cause for tears. Now, there is a Canadian comedian named Mary Walsh who says something very similar. I don't mean to be snobby about comedy, but there are laugh buttons that aren't being pushed when you're picking your nose. And with some of those buttons, you get a deeper laugh, a kind of, oh, that, that's tragically funny. And I think that's what Kenneth Coach is getting at when he says, the style is laughter, the subject may be a cause for tears. Maher and Miller are reviving political satire, says Stanley Kaufman. Not the easy to take nonpartisan topicality of Leno and Letterman, but informed, savvy, opinionated comedy about real issues. Maher, Bill Maher, and Dennis Miller are keeping, helping stand up comedy escape from its contemporary cul de sac, where Jerry Seinfeld clones obsess about sex, TV, and life's little annoyances. Um, of course, Tony Hendra has much to say about the state of modern comedy. Um, seeing modern-day comedy clubs is a little more than audition halls for television, and the subject matter of the modern-day co co comedian is um, essentially, quintessentially harmless, so that it can be readily uh, be reproduced into a mass medium such as television. Stanley Kaufman discusses Robin Williams, a unique national treasure, part competent actor, part Jonathan Winters spinoff, part social political surgeon. Now, Robin Williams takes as his direct line of descent uh, those innovative comedians of basically who arose basically in the 1950s, Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, um, Jonathan Winters, of course, um, Shelley Berman, um, and those are the big, you know, those are the big four. And then, of course, you have uh, people like um, Bob Newhart, and then uh, later the Smothers Brothers. Um, the people who later became famous for appearing on Laughing, Lily Tomlin and Goldie Hawn. Um, all of these folks arose in the 50s and 60s. And of course, Robin Williams, who really arose in the 70s, takes as his direct line of ascent those individuals. Whereas, um, someone like Richard Pryor is basically Lenny Bruce by way of Bill Cosby and, to a lesser, much lesser extent, Dick Gregory. Um, so, nothing is really created in isolation. You, you're either fighting the past or you are building on the past, but um, 
things just don't come out of nowhere. When the Smother Brothers' cheerful, dopey banter was revealed as a mask for some impious wit, they were told that they were incompetent to make social comment. The disparity between Saul's viewpoint and that of the military-industrial complex he satirized was one of degree and not of a fundamental nature. Saul, Bruce, Ellison, Vonnegut, Heller, Ferlinghetti, and Ginsburg targeted the injustice, repression, and bureaucratic corruption lying beneath Madison Avenue's image of a prosperous, contented, suburban haven. Of course, not everybody has as high opinion of satire as myself. George Kaufman once famously said that satire is what closes on Saturday night. And just because something is recognized as a necessary ingredient in that great stew pot that we call humor does not mean that everybody universally finds it amusing or even interesting. Now, talking of Lenny Bruce, it's been said, Lenny Bruce evoked an iconoclasm and irreverence that mirrored the tempo and thrust of black street humor and was viewed as a dire threat to white America, in much the same way, of course, that rock and roll um, evoked an iconoclasm and irreverence that mirrored the temples of black street music. Richard Pryor, says Pauline Kale, was a master of lyrical obscenity, the only great poet satirist among our comics. Stephen Canfer discusses Alan Sherman, who, of course, arose in, in the same, more or less the same period as Woody Allen, Bill Cosby, and, um, and that would be about 1963, 1965, um, just when the, uh, the, the market for comedy albums began to taper off after a 10-year boom, which more or less began in the mid-50s and ended rather abruptly in the mid-60s. Uh, you can trace the trajectory of the, the album as a comedic art form, and Tony Hendra does this. Comedy LPs had begun denting the billboard charts in the late 1950s with records by Nichols and May, and of course Inside Shelley Berman. But by July 16, 1961, in the top 150, there were over a dozen comedy albums, half of them in the top 40. Shelley Berman, Nichols and May, Jonathan Winters, Dick Gregory, Bob Newhart, November 23, 1963, Alan Sherman and there were three Smothers Brothers albums in the top 150. But by September 11, 1965, it was basically just Bill Cosby and the occasional Smothers Brothers LP. From then on, comedy albums had peaked for good. Although, of course, uh, there was a resurgence in comedy albums with the release of some of Lenny Bruce's material, Dick Gregory was still going somewhat strong in the late, even as late as the late 60s. And then, of course, you had Robert Klein, Cheech and Chong, and um, George Carlin, above all, as uh, best-selling comedy albums of the 1970s. Um, even, even as late as the early 1980s, Eddie Murphy had a best-selling comedy album, although I find a good deal of Eddie Murphy's comedy to be derivative, if not, in fact, blatantly racist. And this is a point that, um, that uh, Tony Hendra makes about um, Eddie Murphy's uh, comedy. In fact, it's sort of third-rate Lenny Bruce strained through Richard Pryor. And if you've ever heard any of Richard Pryor's brilliant albums of the 70s, he was one of the people I forgot to mention as one of the principal um, comedy album artists of the 70s. Of course, his domain was uh, basically in the later part of the 70s with, if you'll excuse my use of the expression, Bicentennial Nigger, which came out in 1976. Um, and he had a brilliant stream of albums, and of course that great concert film that he made. Um, P.J. O'Rourke, like all true satirists, is motivated by anger at the human folly, greed, and stupidity which lie behind our collective failure to deal with problems, like those he refers to, all of which should be perfectly capable of solution, says Stephen Dunstan. Um, Anyway, Stephen Dunstan may be a little bit off the point concerning P.J. O'Rourke. Um, Hendra, not speaking impartially perhaps, has far more devastating things to say about P.J. O'Rourke. He says that P.J. O'Rourke, left to himself, lurched between imitation of other styles and invectives. 
He seemed to believe that by being racist or sexist, he would qualify as a young Turk of humor. And it was the painstaking way this appeared to have been worked out that was so laughably humorous. Hendra is not surprised that P.J. O'Rourke made his uh, big splash with what was later to become the American Spectator. He characterizes R. Emmett Carroll Jr., its editor, as uh, a graduate of the William F. Buckley School of Humor, whose basic technique is to create great swatches of alliterative Latinism over gutter-level bigotry. The neo-Augustan wit left those at the National Lampoon cold. I don't know if I'm even going to get the chance to discuss the National Lampoon, but um, because, of course, time is short and the water rises. Anyway, I was making a point about Alan Sherman, who, of course, is in that great stream of um, parodic comic song commentators, um, you know, Tom Lehrer and much later, Randy Newman. Of course, Tom Lehrer's wit was rather mordant by comparison to Alan Sherman's, and Randy Newman's wit, equally mordant perhaps, but um, also more artistically motivated, transcending mere humor per se, and uh, definitely partaking of satire in a way that few have even attempted to match. And I think the only person who can compare um, to, to Randy Newman is, to a certain lesser degree, John Prine. And of course, um, you also have Tom Waits, um, <clears throat> who's often funny without necessarily being satiric. Alan Sherman, a former game show producer, was not an original Jewish comic like his contemporary Lenny Bruce, nor was he a staccato stand-up performer of the Henny Youngman School. He trod the middle ground, caterwauling his own mocking lyrics set to the music of classical and pop war horses. Sherman's genial delivery concealed a sneer that lay just below the surface. And um, as long as we're talking about figures who are similar to Alan Sherman, uh, we might want to also talk about Doodles Weaver, and um, or prior to that, of course, you had Spike Jones, who did things that were very similar to what Alan Sherman made his name doing in the 1960s. Stephen Dunstan, who we cited concerning P.J. O'Rourke, says, Nothing is meant to date more quickly than humor, and satire is often the most transitory of all, but Peter Cook's best work has worn remarkably well. He was original, surreal, inspired, lunatic, whimsical, satirical, absurd, absurdist, funny. And uh, Peter Cook, a British comedian, um, immediately what springs to mind when reading this description is, of course, the probably the greatest television comedian of the 1950s. Uh, I'm not talking about Milton Berle. Uh, I am talking, of course, about Sid Caesar and, of course, Imogene Coca. Anger is no substitute for a cohesive vision, says Red Cat and Henderson. And this is a very important point. Anger, of course, has a great deal to do with the satiric impulse, but a cohesive vision generates satiric material. In fact, a cohesive vision generates all good comedy, I believe. Um, a writer's concerns are with all mankind, and although he cannot command their obedience, he can assign them their duty. That's a rather high pollutant way of referring to satire. You'll be surprised to note that it was said by Thomas Paine in 1770. He can assign them their duty. Being earthy is like being satirical, says Florence King. The satirist needs a like-minded audience of co-conspirators who are secure enough not to take everything literally. They cannot be incorrigible romantics or nervous statist seekers. And this is a very important point. A good deal of what I would call the newer comedy, or what Tony Henry called boomer humor, arose in the 1950s, just that time when people were, in fact, characterized as nervous status seekers, the man in the gray flannel suit. Um, Nigel Nicholson talks about sentimentality as a, an enemy of satire. Sentimentality is false association like advertising a detergent by a monkey's tea party or by kittens boxing, boxing each other, uh, which in itself is uh, a very amusing uh, notion. There is a danger in Gallo's humor that the brain will overhear it and think it's serious, says D. Lipsky and A. Abrams. Karl Popper states, 
People have an easier time identifying human mistakes and agreeing on the nature of ideal societies that would make everyone happy. And this, of course, is um, the whole reason satire even exists, because people do have an easier time identifying mistakes and agreeing on solutions. The dramatic style gets its vitality from the most brutal fact imaginable in a society that believes in science, the fact that certainty is impossible. And of course, that is again the satire, the satirist's meat and potatoes, the notion that certainty is impossible. But one mustn't allow this, um, this uh, revelation or this uh, realization that certainty is impossible to shade into cynicism. Because, as Hal Bruno says, one thing you learn is that when you're cynical, you lose touch with things. Saul Bellow states, no writer can take it for granted that the views of his characters will not be attributed to him personally. And that is, of course, the danger that the satirist faces, at least in the written medium, but as well in the spoken medium to a certain lesser degree, that if you satirize being a blowhard, people will mistake you for one. Or if you satirize racism, people will say you're racist. When writers hate, it all comes down to something very simple. His words against mine. Now, Florence King talks about the satirist as addressing an audience of co-conspirators. I prefer to think of writers as being co-conspirators as opposed to bitter rivals. But unfortunately, Martin Amos's notion of writers is perhaps more accurate than Florence King's ideal of the satirist and his or her audience. Richard Holmes said, I did feel that the very English way I was brought up was stifling. It didn't seem to be to me enough. Everybody has this other country, this alternative identity. I wanted to find that second identity so I could stand outside myself to some degree. And in order to do that, you need a different geography, a different language. It's as if you could reinvent yourself. And that is, to a certain degree, what the satirist does. Uh, one may be as mild-mannered as can possibly be in one of one's identities, but as a satirist, of course, one has a savage eye um, concerning the, the shortcomings of mankind. And, of course, nobody is a better example of this than H.L. Mencken. I recently read Robert Polito's biography of Jim Thompson, the, uh, the, the noir writer, um, although he doesn't state this anywhere in the book, Jim Thompson was a profound satirist in books such as The Killer Inside Me and Population 1280. He is using one of the satirist's basic tools, writing it in the persona of a false and lying narrator, uh, one who is not the author, but rather a construct of the author, um, somebody who says things that the author himself does not believe. In my uh, studies in English literature with Monroe Engel, he referred to this as the implied narrator versus, of course, the actual narrator. They are two separate things. Exile is a condition the thinkers should aspire to, if only in imagination, says Edward Said. Again and again, when we consider some of the best writers of the 20th century, we come across the conundrum of the writer as intimately aware of every facet of the social social sphere of which he writes about, and at the same time exiled from it. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, for example, um, to a certain lesser degree, Henry James, um, James Joyce, the, the ultimate exile. Or they cannot be a physical exile, but rather an emotional recluse. Somebody, say, like Franz Kafka. Exile, says Edward Said, means that you are always going to be marginal and that what you do as an intellectual has to be made up because you cannot follow a prescribed path. If you experience that fate not as deprivation and as, and as something to be bewailed, but as a source of freedom, a process of discovery in which you do things according to your own pattern as various interests seize your attention and as the particular goal you set yourself dic dictates, that is a unique pleasure. Of course, um, one of my own very merry quips is that uh, the nice thing about being in exile is that you don't have to buy Christmas presents. Um, and, you know, that sort of cuts deeper than the mere 
surface superficiality is the amusing jape. Um, because, of course, buying Christmas presents is one of those rigorously proscribed rituals which takes place every year, and being in exile means that you may lack in emotional attachments, but on the other hand, you're not subjected to the stifling rituals that these emotional attachments invariably carry with them. Understanding is something one does best when one is on the borderline, says Peter Hogue. And of course, again and again, Jim Thompson, to get back to him, um, writes about being on the borderline. The quality we are always looking for in imaginative writing is the sense of being vestigially foreign in a world where we nevertheless feel quite at home, says James Hamilton Patterson. See, you can probably uh, see what my next point is going to be, that the, the injury that the artist suffers early in life, which causes him or her to want to create works of art, amounts, in effect, to a type of emotional exile from the unhurt self, the uninjured self. A public kept ignorant by commercial media in these times puts it, um, in one of their editorials. And that, of course, is something that the satirist is profoundly alienated from, the public who is kept ignorant by commercial media. Adam Zagajewski, writing in the same journal, states, a conservative thinker predicted that 20th century culture inevitably would break up into small provinces. It would be fragmented and deprived of an integrated vision of reality. Indeed, that is what has happened. Poets, composers, painters, all live within self-contained and self-satisfied professional enclaves and scramble for recognition almost exclusively within their own sects. Um, I must say this is a prediction that I myself made in 1987, not having the uh, benefit of having read this particular writer, but it makes a very important point um, that, that um, the artistic world is no longer unified, but rather separate and distinct. It's, there's not enough of a mix going on. Uh, now, in the 1950s, jazz musicians and comedians were very closely linked to a certain degree because the improvisatory nature of the jazz medium found a corresponding improvisatory impulse in ensemble humor, um, sketch or review humor, and even in the work of comedians such as Lenny Bruce or Mort Saul um, or Shelley Berman. It, there was this uh, taking a premise and leaping from it or in leapfrogging between one aspect of the premise and another in a totally spontaneous and improvised way. Now, to attempt to create the same sort of linkage between rock and roll and comedy is perhaps a fool's errand, but one which um, many have tried, perhaps. Um, I don't know. I certainly tried it in my heyday and uh, found that rock and roll is basically about uh, it's three-minute epiphanies, and comedy is something more and yet less than three-minute epiphanies stacked one on the other. The narcissism of the small difference shows how people could be induced to quarrel more and more about less and less, says Christopher Hitchens, citing Sigmund Freud. And this is, of course, getting back to the notion that the arts are fragmenting. The purpose of satire, it has rightly been said, is to strip the veneer of comforting illusion and cozy half-truth. And our job, as we see it, is to put it back again, says Flanders and Swan, who were British humorists of the 1960s. But they make a very important point. The purpose of satire is to strip off the veneer of comforting illusion and cozy half-truth. And of course, um, the, the idea that the arts are somehow fragmenting into discrete little fragments um, or shivers, I wanted to say, um, in no way aids this process. Satire, in order to be truly effective, has to partake of virtually every art form, be it a degraded art such as advertising or an elevated art such as classical music. The satirist, ideally, would know a little bit about everything, and I will give you a list of what Tony Hendra 
uh, stated as his ideal of boomer humor, that strangely uh, astronomical um, <coughs> phrase that he has come up with to uh, describe what his notion of um, the new humor should constitute. Um, he talks about the National Lampoon as uh, ushering in the era of modern parody, bi-level satire with an acute awareness of original form that distinguished 70s humor from its antecedents. And he goes on to state that the people who wrote for the National Lampoon were indiscriminately educated, media-saturated, post-indoctrinated. The dialects we spoke were legion, film cliché, literary reference, advertising, militarese, political rhetoric, religious, scientific, hippie babble, mail order catalog, rock mulch, suburban gush, rock mush actually, suburban gush, pop art, militant menace, street demonic, you name it. And um, of course any writer should probably have a wide ranging expertise on a few subjects and a more narrow uh, knowingness about a great many more. I'm not saying that it's possible or even desirable necessarily to be a renaissance man, but it certainly is possible to know a lot about a little and a little about a lot. Um, in that way, knowing a lot about certain subjects can enable the satirist to attack commonplace beliefs which he knows, thanks to his expertise, are strictly untrue or to at least, at the very least, as a social critic, find mistakes in what others say about certain media. For example, I'm pretty knowledgeable about the history of the American comic strip and the comic book, and I can spot errors a mile off, and believe me, the errors that people make about this medium are so widespread that it leaves one, leads one to doubt whether they know what they're talking about about other things. Um, Celebrities are invariably celebrity mad, just as liars always believe liars, says Gore Vidal. And um, again, Tony Hendrick, and I don't want this to be a Tony Hendrick song, but uh, he does have a great deal to say about um, many of the topics that we're touching on here. Um, celebrities are always celebrity mad, just as liars always believe liars, says Gore Vidal. Henry, Hendricks puts it this way, from a purist point of view, a satirical star is a contradiction in terms. Stardom is basically a technological commodity. Stars are instant stereotypes. Satire of television, meaning the satire of the performity it promotes, the conformity it promotes, has always been a major theme of boomer humor because TV was a technological hoax that gave you the illusion of participating in events you could never experience, but in reality excludes you from them, condemned you to a long distance voyeurism, and in doing so actually deprived you the simple and mundane habit, denied you the simple and mundane habit of human contact. He goes on to say that Saturday Night Live actually dealt very rarely with boomer humor per se. Um, the Three Penny Opera. Let's just take as an example um, Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera. Um, a bourgeois audience uncomprehendingly applauded its own conceptual annihilation, is Lee Siegel's description of it. And that, of course, is true satire, uh, insofar as one is able to present didacticism in such an amusing way that you are impelled to and applaud your own conceptual annihilation. Um, of course, that cuts a little too harshly for many satirists who prefer to speak to the converted rather than uh, to gall the ignorant. A cursory view of advertisements will show ad agencies using two basic motivating factors sex and the status that comes with employment. 
that of course is a profoundly satirical thing to say. Uh, the more so because it is strictly true. That literary rarity, a good man, says Jeannie Belafonte. When I was taking a course in the development of the American novel, which um, I helped put together with the aid of my junior tutor in college, uh, one of the things that he insisted I read was um, Barry Esmond by Thackeray. It, it is, um, I'm sorry, not Barry Esmond, uh, some book that the protagonist is named Henry Esmond. It is a literary portrait of a good man. It's very difficult to write about a good man, says my tutor, Andrew Kimball. Um, much easier it is to write a novel along the lines of Vanity Fair about a false and duplicitous hero. Poshlust is a term that Nabokov invented. Poshlust means kitsch that thinks it is not. And that, of course, is yet another prime target for the satirical writer. <coughs> the, Henry, the, the Hemingway biographer Mello say, sees that fiction is a complex weave of life circumstances, stray knowledge, and unbidden psychological motivations, old hurts, new fears, grievances real or imagined, mere coincidences, suppressed rivalries, the constructive urge. He insists that it is in the distinction between a writer's life and work that one is more likely to find those clues that suggest the writer's motivations, the exercise of the creative mind. He reminds us that literary epiphanies have their origins in the mundane world, in the banalities of dusty journeys, cheap hotels, sweltering nights, noise, crowds, personal animosity. And of course, the reason this is in the, sat the section pertaining to satire is that the satirist, in turn, like any writer, transmogrifies the commonplaces of everyday experience into a medium which can be called art. H.L. Mencken, who of course is one of the great satirists of the 20th century, stated, it is inaccurate to say I hate everything. I am strongly in favor of common sense, common honesty, and common decency. This makes me forever ineligible for any public office, which of course in a sense is a, an extension of what Mark Twain said, that there is no Native American criminal class except Congress. Carolyn Clay writes of King Lear, it stretches from the naked howl of prehistory to the barren landscape of the absurd. Lear, in all of its appalling pessimism and tenderness, wound up in the bones of Samuel Beckett. And uh, another strain of 20th century satire is, in fact, the works of um, the surrealists uh, and what we'll call the absurdists, people like Ionesco um, or Samuel Beckett. Ben Johnson wrote in a poem, well, I will scourge those apes, and to those courteous eyes oppose a mirror as large as is the stage whereon we act, where they shall see the time's deformity, anatomized in every nerve and sinew, with constant courage and contempt of fear. And that last line is perhaps the watchword of the satirist, constant courage and contempt of fear. Now, Yevgeny Yevtushchenko, uh, somebody who I'm not given much to quoting, states, maturity is measured by the number of lost illusions. And that perhaps is the difference between the fledgling writer and the mature writer, who the fledgling writer later becomes. The hurt, the, the throbbing sense of disappointment is still there in the younger writer, and it's still a fresh wound, but to the mature writer, it's more the notion of lost illusions which motivates his impulses rather than a fresh hurt. Satire takes no hostages, says David Bromwich. This relates back to the uh, quote made famous by Saul Bellow, citing Chekhov, that in the heart of every writer there should be a splinter of ice. 
Well, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, David Bromwich talks about Dr. Strangelove, and um, he refers to satire of the Strangelove type. One, sees the world is divided between thugs and saps, and suspects the saps may also be thugs. Two, impartially hates the originals of all its characters, while relishing everything the characters make of the originals. Three, never explores the issue because it has already reached its conclusion. A lowdown so complete it can feel like indifference. A saturated skepticism in which the paltriest show of vanity, greed, or power, hungry, power hunger seems on a par with the most atrocious crime. Four, is not encumbered by a wish to preserve appearances or to preserve any, anything. Of course, um, he speaks of satire, but this sounds to me a lot more like nihilism. But David Bromwich goes on to write, All satire was once compassion. It no longer is and no longer cares what we call it. Kubrick thinks of people as more like dolls and more like apes than the earnest strivers or helpers that a taste for exulting companions has led us to believe we are. His usual method has been to work out a, a screenplay that shows people, mostly men, as being so primitive or so hyper-evolved that they have no claim to the passions they display from habit. T.S. Eliot writes something very trenchant about satire and irony. He says, real irony is an expression of suffering, and the greatest ironist was the one who suffered the most, Jonathan Swift. David Bromwich um, writes of Jonathan Swift and says, there are works that triumph over their authors, that float above the zeitgeist like a cloud or an emanation. Gulliver's Travels was like that. Its timely jokes trained on the 1720s, its broader myth, an unforgettable point-for-point -point negative of enlightenment humanism. Our age of the instant conversion of thought, whim, or delusion into acts of binding force. George Meredith writes in his uh, in one of his books of uh, the comic spirit as casting an oblique light followed by a, a silvery laughter when it sees mankind self-deceived or hoodwinked, given to run riot and idolatrous drifting in the vanities, congregating in absurdities, planning short-sightedly, plotting dementedly. All these, of course, are characteristics of men and mankind. Now, some people say mistake mere tastelessness for satire, and Tina Brown makes an important distinction. She says, it's important for a magazine to have lapses in taste. If you don't, you're going to be completely bland. And that is something that satire almost never is unless it is on purpose. Say that were to satirize the work of Garrison Keillor, for example, or Edgar Guest, to use a more remote example. Misanthropy, says Florence King, is a realistic attitude towards human nature for Americans who do not necessarily hate everybody, but are tired of compulsory gregariousness, gregariousness, sorry, fevered friendliness, we never close compassion, goo-goo humanitarianism, sensitivity that never sleeps in politicians paralyzed by a need to be loved. And there is that strain of American uh, hail fellow well met uh, that uh, of course was anatomized in the satiric novel by um, Sinclair Lewis, Babbitt, and to a lesser degree in Main Street, um, which purported to show Americans as being so shabby that they will never recognize themselves in the portrait. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, for Sinclair Lewis, people, Americans did recognize themselves in the devastating portraits of 20th century American boomers. Uh, bo boomers in the 20s weren't necessarily baby boomers. They were people who uh, were relentless self-promoters and promoters of their locality. Do keep yourself pressed up against the wall, said Sherwood Anderson to Mark Twain, to Hart Crane. I imagine revolution doesn't accomplish much, but constant irritation with ugliness is necessary. And that is as good a satiric credo as any I can find. Constant irritation 
with ugliness is necessary. And Sherwood Anderson, of course, um, was one of the very finest short story writers of the 20th century, along with Hemingway. And um, his Winesburg, Ohio, which I'm sure many people have read in high school, is every bit, in my mind, on a par with James Joyce's Dubliners. Um, the two seem to be mirror analogs of each other. Helen Bendler, who uh, writes very intelligently about poetry, says of irony, though irony is always, for the best of reasons, frequent in colloquial talk among the oppressed, it is oddly infrequent in the high literature of oppression, which tends towards the melodramatic and the tragic. And she's talking here of Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin, Zola, and um, Hood. The sort of humorous irony found everywhere in Langston Hughes depends on the conscious diminution of self, which is precisely the sort of diminution that the role of the tragic victim cannot tolerate. Yet, true moral defiance lies in refusing the very role of victim, which is always a role conferred by others rather than self-invented, says Helen Bendler, again, very presciently. Sean French, French writes of irony. Irony is a truly valuable commodity. It used to be feared that upmarket viewers could be secured only with expensive genres, such as quality drama. Now it seems they can be lured into watching game shows or chat shows, the cheapest of formats, as long as they are done with the lightest patina of satire. The modern world is, says Brad Lighthouse, or at least as Shaw memorably conceives it, a place where pieties must be uprooted conscientiously yet wittily. We must be deadly serious in our every flippancy. And of course, that's a pretty good description of satire. We must be deadly serious in our every flippancy. Alfred Apple Jr. writes about Fats Waller. As literary terms, Fats Waller's caprices and parodies are implicitly moral acts of character, the domain of traditional satire, moral acts of character, the domain of traditional satire, deadly serious in our every flippancy, constant irritation with ugliness. Louis Armstrong, um, says Alfred Apple Jr., offered up a radical art of the vernacular. And again, it's a pretty good watchword for the satirist to offer up a radical art of the vernacular. Which means, of course, you have to be thoroughly grounded not only in their vernacular, but it was in the deviations from the vernacular which form the basis of radical art. I'm afraid now I have a rather lengthy quote about camp, which pretty much encapsulates the idea of what constitutes camp, which is, of course, a very popular concept since it is so frequently utilized on television. <clears throat> Camp, of course, wants to have it both ways. It wants to be shabby and yet admired for its wit. In any event, I will pause here briefly and be back momentarily with satire. Well, I'm back. Camp. Camp, says Gareth Cook. An ironic taste for the outrageously tasteless Camp has gone from being an obscure sensibility with murky roots in the gay subculture to a cultural mainstay, but camp also has a nasty side. You show off tastes that everyone knows are not your own. Camp is often rich with exaggeration. It is always heavy with irony, but masked camp can be smug, snobbish, and even mean. Camp has come to play on and feed some of the nation's most damaging social divisions. Knowingly embracing bad taste, it could be said, as a way of rejecting class distinctions. In fact, the proliferation of camp shows that Americans are still obsessed by class. The idea is to show that you have enough taste to choose the right bad taste. To know just the right trash and to embrace it with the proper irony is an art form. Integral to the camp sensibility is a mocking and superior attitude toward the lower classes, especially poor whites the one group that even the most touchy-feely liberals feel fully licensed to mock without remorse. White trash is a 
convenient notion that allows us to maintain the idea that social advancement is based on talent. Their plight, we reason, is entirely their fault. When today's elite take up what they imagine to be the accoutrements of poor whites, it is a way of saying, I am royalty. I would never seriously wear this stuff. The camp sensibility allows you to square the circle. You are in touch with the common man, even if you show you are above him. For sure, irony can be a powerful, critical tool. Any comedian knows that. But camp is a kind of fake compassion. We pretend we care, but our worst prejudices prevail. These class barriers aren't just a cultural flaw. They are a deep social pathology. But we're numbing up and feeling good about it, keeping down people who could do great things. Satire, says David Anson, speaking of the movie To Die For, satire has never been Hollywood's genre of choice, and it seems more endangered than ever in an era of talk show confession, victimology, and political correctness, an era inimical to the forum's hanging judge inclination. The satirist looks down on his subject, and this is not a nice thing to do if you think art's job is only to empower and ennoble. The trouble is we've left mean-spiritedness to the politicians where it can do real damage. In the hands of an artist, a blast of nastiness can free the mind of camp. And again, freeing the mind of camp, of preconceived notions, of cliches, of stereotypes, that is perhaps satire's most profound service to humanity. Martin Amos talks about style and says, style, of course, is not something grappled to regular prose. It is intrinsic to perception. We are fond of separating style and content for the purposes of analysis and so on, but they aren't separable. They come from the same place. And style is morality. Style judges. Satire, says Camille Paglia, for all its ancient origin, from its from its ancient origin, is always offensive. It breaks every rule of decorum and violates every taboo. Satire is bawdy, repulsive, profane. It tells the truth about our secret fears, lusts, and aggressions, our gross physiology and mortality. Now, she goes on to say, no artist or performer has to justify his or her work to critics coming from a political perspective, which is a point I made in the first hour of this presentation. Political correctness is inimical to satire. Again, Camille Paglia says, I think the job of any good performer is to make people think by saying things that are honest, that are different. Now, I'm not claiming this mantle for myself, but I would like it to be known that that is what differentiates the wrong hero from a great many other much more successful comedians. It's one of the great things about great works of art that they can bear, and indeed that they invite a super plenitude of possible readings, some of them contradictory. Now, nobody bothers to satirize someone like Stephen King. No, it's um, folks who have their own distinct style and something to say who are most frequently the targets of satire and parody. Now, Giles Smith, speaking of the producer of the Beatles, George Martin, says that he was someone who was well aware of how closely absurdity stalks decorum. Philip Henscher talks about Noel Coward, one of the great satirists of the 20th century. What the critics of Noel Coward's throwaway apparently anti-patriotic numbers fail to see is that they are celebrating exactly their own cynicism as a great national trait. And it's a pity that in the United States, everybody is so friendly that cynicism is perceived as hostile rather than as a means of dealing with that which is or would be otherwise unbearable. Gallows humor, in a word. Coward was a man who put almost all of his genius into the apparently ephemeral. It wouldn't be surprising if his tireless, admirable glorification of what seemed trivial and quickly forgotten turned into a permanent claim on the attention of posterity. Now, Stuart Clawens talks about outrage and says, it's sad to see how outrage can become a mannerism. In a society where people are forced into selling garbage, garbage sells. 
John Fowles, in a review of Philip Marsden's The Bronski Horse, called it an odd but splendidly imagined fish, part novel and part reverie. And that, of course, would be the ideal form, I think, for a satirical novel. But more of the novel and its forms next week. Right now, we got to get back to satire. Humor in politics, says Emmanuel Axe, presupposes an audience that believes in an, an essential fairness and unwillingness to cause pain on the part of the speaker. This belief, because of the intemperate use of the out-of-context quotes, is in short supply today. And, um, of course, we have Ronald Reagan to thank for this. He says, although he filled many of his speeches with very quips, quips he also stigmatized outgroups with dubious quotations that had no proper sources of citation. It's not what people know that gets them in trouble. It's what people know that ain't so, said Mark Twain. And again, this is a very appropriate way to refer to our former president, Ronald Reagan. Not that I have any ideological acts to grind, mind you. And remember, Ronald Reagan himself was once a comedian for a short time in the 50s. In between his last movie and his stint with a spokesperson for General Electric and later as the narrator of Death Valley Days, Ronald Reagan did two or three weeks in Vegas. He acquitted himself reasonably well, but decided that the rough and tumble of the entertainment world wasn't for him. Of course, if he had gone on to a career in comedy, he would have been one of the old showbiz comedians. Let's talk about old showbiz for a minute. I'm going to cite um, Tony Hendra once more at rather great length, I'm afraid. And I will lead up into a, uh, into a discussion of the role of cliché in satire. In all respects, old showbiz reflected the most basic aspects of Cold War American society and sustained both its message and its emotions. Far from being big-hearted buffoons and big-voiced cockle warmers, old showbiz were the spokesmen and salesmen of orthodoxy. And this, of course, is apropos to Ronald Reagan. Spokesmen and salesmen of orthodoxy, ratifying its attitudes toward children, women, work, endlessly regurgitating its sexual, religious, and racial prejudice, relentlessly equating happiness with money, fulfillment with obedience, love of country with war, and above all, something no one but they could do, manipulating, exploiting, narrowing, and conditioning the public's emotions, keeping things simple, ladling out happy endings, big finishes, good guys win, ain't she something, and kids are the darndest. Lenny Bruce understood that this establishment was not the mindless, harmless, meaningless thing its enemies said it was, but a central and pernicious chorus of false values and induced feelings. In a word, bullshit. Lenny Bruce knew about cliches. He knew that a shared cliche always gets a laugh. He also knew that a cliche means trouble, a sure sign that a thought had been repeated, a feeling received, the start of an untruth. And he knew that celebrity and cliché are inextricably mixed. When everything we say and think has already been said or thought, that's not comforting, but absurd, horrifying. Cliché means we have relinquished the freedom to think and feel for ourselves and ourselves alone, instead of delegating that right to entertainers. Instead, we delegate that right to entertainers, stars, showbiz, and allowing a crust of familiar emotions and familiar beliefs mouthed and repeated by those we imagine are merely amusing us to form over our own lives. As I stated in one of my own works, um, we hire entertainers to act out our lives, to act us out. It wasn't so much that people preferred being entertained to hearing the truth, so much that they increasingly got their truths in the form of entertainment. And this is why, to a certain degree, Satire and television are two inimical forms because television separates and desensitizes, and satire seeks to 
rectify this situation. Lenny Bruce and Mort Salad opened the way with the help of Jonathan Winters and Shelley Berman for a whole new, new wave of nightclub comedians for whom the joke barking style of George Jessel and Fat Jack Leonard was a distant memory. The intellectual and social ferment of the day challenged them all to be both aware and distinctive and something of what you are will be with you till the day you shuffle off. Something of what you are the first time you get on that stage will be with you till the day you shuffle off. A movement, the, the new new comedian represent the new wave of comedians represented a movement whose distinguishing features were intelligence, vitality, nonconformity, innovation, and experiment. There were no assembly line comics in this lot. One riptide in the new wave was that the overwhelmingly Jewish pioneers of the 50s were being emulated by those of all persuasion. Bob Newhart said, My routines came out of things that I considered outrageous, that you had to make fun of. It was the only weapon I had. I think that probably where humor is, is the approaching of that line of being outrageous, and how close you come, can come to it without crossing it, and the nervousness of the audience as you come close to that invisible line. Humor was the only way I could retain my sanity. It's really for your own sanity that you become a comedian. More perhaps on Bob Newhart later. So anyway, that rather lengthy digression. Paul David Wadler on Howard Stern states, We protect satire because it is important that disempowered people have the right to make fun of the powerful. When a powerful, rich, heterosexual white man makes fun of disempowered minorities and women, it also crosses the line and becomes meanness. Howls of derision in themselves soon pall says Ruth Brandon. It's interesting that um, the same point that's made about Howard Stern is also made by Tony Hendra. The notion that a satirical star can exist is somewhat contradictory. From the purest point of view, a satirical star is a contradiction in terms. Martin Amos, says James Wood, me, has the old English interest in the grotesque and the evil. This a tradition allows for authorial sides and ribaldries. Alas, it also allows for a certain vulgarity or simplicity. Amos has Dickens' tendency towards caricature, toward applying a comic collar so tightly to the subjects that they lack aeration. Like Dickens, he loves lists, and like Dickens, he ripples and writes in fluent surges and comic riffs. His prose writes better than the world lives. For Martin Amos, the world does not exist to be torn into novelty. It exists to be smartly slapped around a little. He puts down his riffs, and they write no answers back. He has put down his subjects with words. This, of course, is a distinctively British way of looking at satire. And again, next week we'll be talking more about the literary forms of humor to be found principally in the comic novel. George Orwell, not necessarily a satirist, although an essayist of such skill and power that he is able to bring to bear some of the most profoundly characteristic aspects of satire to his work. Um, basically, the, the, the impatience with sham and pretense and the overwhelming urge to translate bureaucraties back into the original English that it so um, dishearteningly deforms. David Cayute says, George Orwell is the kind of writer who wanted to offer the people their language, their country, and their culture, not take it away from them. Now, Alistair Reed writes about Jonathan Rivers. No, I'm sorry, not... Jonathan Rivers, but uh, the uh, companion of Robert Graves. Rivers made Graves see that his cure was in writing, that the unconscious was the source not only of his nightmares, but 
of his creativity. He urged Graves to see his poetry to explore, to use his poetry to explore his pain. He showed Graves just how his life and art were essentially connected. To use your writing to explore your pain, that is basically the impulse that all writers have. Richard Oliva writes about satire, getting back to the subject of satire, and away from the subject which recurs in virtually every week of this presentation, the hidden source of humor is suffering, as Mark Twain put it. All satire attacks the self-destructive stupidity of humankind, yet if the main characters of the satire appear moronic, the thrust of the satire is canceled. No satire should let us off the hook. Which is why the movies of Pauly Shore, and to a lesser extent, those of Jim Carrey, do not constitute satire, nor do the, uh, the quirky theory of series of movies, nor do the police academy or, uh, or series of movies. Um, the human race can be satirically skewered only when the satirist shows that even its brightest members serve folly. Satire implies a degree of intelligence that Hollywood appears to be uncomfortable with, is I think the point that Richard Oliva is making. Frank S. Meyer wrote in 1958, Never has a society been more smugly proof against satire than ours. When one idea is as good as another, when a, def when a dully equalizing relativism destroys all definitions and distinctions, satire is impotent. When the satiric genius works by shocking the reader into using the standards he implicitly holds but has failed to apply, it achieves its results by creating so savage a presentation of contemporary evil, exaggerated, grotesque, caricatured, but a true simulacrum of the social scene, that the bland and habitual surface of actuality is driven apart. But where there are no standards, satire has no grounds from which to fight. It is so much more exhilarating to the spirit as the evil that human beings have created is castigated by the conscious vigor of a human being, not by the mere accident of the mirror, the momentary, unpurposeful reflection of evil back upon evil. John Potteret says, Comedy demands that characters who are vain, self-regarding, and self-deluded be stripped of their delusions and forced to confront the truth about themselves. But, of course, when that is not possible, then it is also less likely that you will be able to accomplish this. Josh Billings, um, who, if this were in fact a, an academic course, would be one of the people I would recommend that uh, the students read, stated, the fellow who writes the bank's advertisements is not the one who makes the loans. And that is a pretty good um, uh, intuitive definition of satire. Failed irony is mere sarcasm. Sarcasm is frequently juvenile insult, says Joyce Carol Oates. So let us distinguish between satire, failed irony, and mere sarcasm. I think we probably know the difference between satire and parody, but um, we do not necessarily perceive any great difference between satire and irony. And irony is a very difficult thing to define. Entire books have been written about irony. Understated or tacit irony is usually fatal, says Alexander Cockburn. Basically because people are, you, you would uh, probably mistake understated irony for um, somebody who is in fact speaking in their own voice. Good satire, of course, should never make that mistake. We'll be talking in a little bit about Ambrose Bierce, and uh, a good thing, too, because to my mind, he is one of the 20th century's greatest satirists. I'm afraid I've bandied this phrase around quite a bit. Of course, he is a literary satirist. In the, uh, in the mold of Bret Hart and Mark Twain, Candide, says Richard Holmes, has been described as the Thousand and One Nights condensed by Swift and translated by Montaigne, yet its speed and wit and counterpoint are wholly Voltairean. For Voltaire, the essence of intellectual freedom was wit. Wit, which means both intelligence and humor, was the primary birthright of man, 
The free play of wit brings enlightenment and also a certain kind of laughter, the laughter that distinguishes man from the beasts. But it is not a simple kind of laughter. It is also very close to tears. Life amuses and delights him. It also causes him pain and grief. Robert Musel, in his book, The Man Without Qualities, stated, There is no great idea that stupidity not, could not put to its own uses. It can move in all directions and put on all the guises of truth. The truth, by comparison, has only one appearance and only one path and is always at a disadvantage. A very Orwellian thing to say. There is no great idea that stupidity could not put to its own uses. It can put on all of the guises of truth. The truth, by comparison, has only one appearance and only one path. Now, Graydon Carter writes about Chris Hitchens, the writer for The Nation. Every magazine needs a Peck's bad boy. He's always very much biting the ankle of the overdog. Florence King wrote of Gore Vidal that he was a misanthrope who knows everybody. That's a pretty good re definition of the ideal satirist. No issue is so urgent that it cannot be encapsulated in a facile irony, says Hilton Kramer on Lewis Lapham, who writes for The Atlantic. As you can see, the, uh, this section of our presentation is going to consist of writers sniping at other writers. Edmund Wilson said of Graham Greene that he created a palette of sour colors, a repertoire of sickening suggestions. Edmund Wilson wrote about the futurists, cubists, and of Stravinsky. Their works are not the result of enjoyment. They are grating and bewildering cries of exasperated nerves. These are hard days for subcultures, says John Potter. Subcultures are, after all, populated by alienated souls who are doing everything they can to be to outrage and mock conventional values. But what can the most alienated soul do when the world of convention is now dedicated to seeking out the latest, the newest, the hippest in alienation and turning it into a fashion appropriate for a Paris runway and a Soho boutique? Again, this is an uh, extension of the notion that life is so outrageous that parody and satire have precious little uh, ground in which to operate. Uh, the notion that uh, alienated subcultures are now uh, no longer, far from being demo day, they are in fact the, um, they are a la mode. That does not necessarily mean, however, that subcultures will cease to exist any more than satire, parody, irony, even sarcasm will fade away under the uh, strain of a unitarian form of culture. Raise and self-reinvention is one of the great themes of American literature, says Michael Kinsley. Not only this uh, sense of irony, the um, this sense of distance, this sense of exile, this uh, sense of wanting to assuage uh, long buried hurts, or this sense of reconciling oneself to um, disappointments of one's aspirations, but also raise and self-reinvention, of course, we have only to refer to the great Gatsby as perhaps the principal example of brazen self-reinvention being one of the great themes of American literature. Men may be convinced, but they cannot be pleased against their will, says Dr. Johnson. And of course, that is one of the, uh, the chores that satire attempts to accomplish, that, that it may, uh, in fact, the obverse of what satire seems to attempt to do, it doesn't so much it seem to uh, convince men against their will, but it seeks to please them almost against their will, at least if it's doing their job. Some writers will make worthwhile and enduring artworks out of their concerns, while others make exploitative, glib, glib or sentimental ones says Anna Kesey. Among a writer's tasks is to investigate the forces that shape people. And of course, the whole spate of military novels which arose in the 1950s and early 60s, The Naked and the Dead by um, Norman Mailer and um, From Here to Eternity by 
by James Jones, and of course, uh, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Those arose out of a World War II culture, which uh, creative writers were beginning to reconcile themselves with. Um, so, if we were to uh, assign a theme for writers in the 90s, it would be, in fact, uh, what was so eloquently uh, called Jihad versus McWorld, the forces of religious fundamentalism, which are unifying and yet divisive, versus the forces of um, commercial advertising, which are divisive and yet unifying. Everything I hear, everything I see, seems to feature exactly the same collision between opposites, says David Shields. And, of course, um, this is hardly a new phenomenon, but one which uh, is a noteworthy one. All popular art forms, musical comedy, rock and roll, eventually reach a point at which they know too much, and then terminal decay sets in. So today, films are mostly about filmmaking, with a diminishing ability to make contact with the world beyond, says Mark Stein. <coughs> An absolutely devastating ridicule of all that is false, primitive, and vicious in current American life. The abuses of power, hero worship, aimless violence, materialistic obsession, intolerance, and every form of hypocrisy. This is no modern day commentator. This is Terry Southern writing about um, William S. Burroughs' Nova Express in the year 1964. But it's a good definition of satire. An absolutely devastating ridicule of all that is false. Now to go back even further, let's quote Marcus Aurelius. Men have come into the world for the sake of one another. Either instruct them then or bear with them. So this devastating ridicule of all that is false ties in with this didactic urge to instruct men. And in the uh, dichotomy of either instructing men or bearing with them, satire seeks to instruct. Mimicry is the defense of individuality, not of surrender, says Joseph Brodsky. <coughs> Seemingly paradoxically, but one can see that by taking something with a profound influence over you and attempting to recast it into your own voice or mode, you are in fact launching a self-defense of your own individuality. Now, Richard Schickel remarks on the uh, prevalence of movies that uh, purport to be based on a true story. A true story invested with relentlessly cliched emotions plays like cheap fiction. Donna Minkowitz has something uh, very, very astute to say when she states, fears of violations of all kinds, parental abandonment, dismemberment and being eaten, punishments worse than death, are essential ingredients to apocalyptic narrative, and it can be strangely comforting to see these fears acknowledged in a story. Nick Gillespie writes, in the tradition of folks such as Mark Twain and Lenny Bruce, Howard Stern's search and destroy hijinks puncture the pretensions of all manner of fakes and phonies. He relentlessly and systematically debunks the fictions we tell about ourselves. He is particularly brilliant at deconstructing the past cliché narratives that actors, politicians, and other public figures spin for their own advantage. In an age of overweening celebrity, that alone should make him a national treasure. Stern is resolutely anti-story, reveling in the mismatch between appearance and reality, between what we say and what we do. He delights in pointing out just how large that gap often is. Stern's popularity is an indication that many people maintain a healthy skepticism towards the machinations of hucksters of all stripes. Stern is, in fact, a moralist whose teachings could hardly be more traditional. 
Indeed, what drives him insane is the degree to which some people get let off the moral hook. While Stern might have the energy level of a child, however, it is wrong to think that he is an unsophisticated observer. Stern, like all great satirists, rarely forgets to train his gun on himself and his image. Although Stern's unending demolition of public and private narratives strikes some as nihilistic, cruel, and perverse, it seems to me that it is also absolutely an appropriate response to the world in which we live. He is driving home the point that when everyone is constantly trading in self-serving visions of good services in themselves, the only proper response is to insist on honesty. It is Stern's willingness to stand by that fundamental truth that energizes his satire and binds him to his audience. Now these are some rather tall um, claims that are made on behalf of Howard Stern, and I'm not sure I agree with them as applied to Stern, but I do agree with them as applied to the genre of satire. I'd have thought there was or could be a great deal of feeling in irony, says D.J. Enright. It's not that the literary experts can't tell chalk from cheese, it's that they prefer to be chalk. Again, D.J. Enright. And this leads us to the notion that standards are being corrupted all over, and that people don't strictly even know anymore what is good and what isn't. You can magnify a character's fundamental evil by granting him a glimmer or two of humanity, or even majesty, says John H. Taylor. And this, of course, leads us to an important point about satire, that um, one can utilize overkill in that it diminishes the impact that satire has. One should, in fact, show a certain degree of restraint, either through one's style or in one's depictions of plot and character. C.D. Lou Adams talks about Ambrose Bierce and says, as a social or literary critic, Ambrose Bierce used an elephant gun indiscriminately on mice and dinosaurs. As a fiction writer, he began in the wake of Bret Hart and was later swamped by Mark Twain, but the best of his macabre tales, whether coldly ironic or comically bloody, retain a unique power to chill the reader. One critic stated that death is Bierce's only subject. Bierce's independent character and his penchant for creating annoyance were noteworthy. He was an eccentric who remains wickedly quotable. Again, this is Phoebe Lou Adams. Bierce himself said, don't believe without evidence. Treat things divine with marked respect. Don't have anything to do with them. Do not trust humanity without collateral security. A profoundly cynical thing to say from what is perhaps the 20th century's most profoundly cynical writer. I will pause briefly and be back with the concluding portion of our presentation entitled Satire. Took a break, had a little something to eat, feel a lot better, thank you. Now it's back to the concluding part of our presentation entitled Satire. Political satire, says Brian D. Johnson, writing in a recent issue of McLean. Political satire has become Canada's unofficial opposition. What seems to give Canadians the edge is that they are on the edge. Comedy requires a passion for detached observation, subverting context. And he goes on to talk about their newest hit show, 22 minutes. Each Monday, the cast members come in with ideas and divvy up the news. Some weeks, it's suicide bombings and painted blood, things you don't want to joke about, says Mary Walsh. And um, this might be worth repeating. Mary Walsh also goes on to say, I don't mean to be snobby about comedy, but there's some comedy that involves picking your nose, and uh, there's other types of uh, comedy and it presses different buttons. And with some of those buttons, 
you get a deeper laugh, the kind of the kind that says, oh that, that's tragically funny. Now, <clears throat> for the concluding portion of our presentation, we'll be talking a little bit about modern day satire and satirical humor. And although I hate to admit that anybody is a greater authority in this than myself, I will have to refer at some length to a book by Tony Hendra entitled Going Too Far. In an introductory segment of his book, Tony Hendra, and all subsequent quotes will be from Tony Hendra until I say otherwise, it is perfectly possible for an ideology to get laughs at the expense of an opponent, but that is ridicule, a patent weapon of humor, but not satire. Satire is inherently unfair. There is no such thing as an even-handed joke. Satire functions on the gap between reality and fantasy. Its dynamic is to reduce pretension and presumption to the tangible and recognizable. A satirist who espouses one ideology over another is saying, in effect, that he is superior, and that makes him satirizable. The satirist believes only that there is no such thing as being half pregnant. Oh, and by the way, the satirist who, uh, who espouses one ideology over another, uh, that is a perfect example of what Rush Limbaugh does. The satirist believes only that there is no such thing as being half pregnant. From the point of view of authority, satire is thus the most inimical form of free speech there is. Indeed, satire dramatizes better than any other use of it the inherent contradiction of free speech, that it functions best when what is being said is at its most dangerous. Where classical satire expresses, expresses revulsion at the departure from widely held standards, boomer humor seems to operate in the opposite direction, rejecting standards, searching for new ones, experimenting with limits, going too far, stop signs being disobeyed at all times and at every conceivable speed. Rejecting both the terrifying impersonality of the bomb and the hallucinatory self-absorption of the box, it quite literally went out, collared the nearest human by the lapel, and started talking. Nightclubs in small theaters were the loci of the first appearances of boomer humor. It rejected the patter and sketches of the previous generation of comedians, material which, for some performers, had lasted them unchanged for a lifetime, and instead started improvising, alone and in groups, a new kind of material that was never the same two nights in a row. It was dangerous for performer and audience, for both could be embarrassed if the comedian blew a real sour note, but the danger gave the whole affair an added thrill when it worked. In print, boomer humor was similarly transformed, by novels such as The Ginger Man by J.P. Dunleavy, Stern by Bruce J. Friedman, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, and Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, and of course later um, Thomas Pynchon with V and the Crying of Log 49, and eventually Gravity's Rainbow. Um, now, Henry makes a very important point about a seminal figure of this type of newer humor. I suppose if you were, wanted to be melodramatic, you would you would uh, date the arrival of this new type of humor from the first emergence of Mort Saul on the scene. Hendra says, Mort Saul probably invented the comedic riff that extended free-form metaphor that explores all the possibilities of a preposterous premise, or paints the details of a verbal picture based on one a technique which became an indispensable creative tool of all modern comedians. Saul was the first person to substitute an idea for the supposed event of an anecdote, the first to take tremendous license 
in leaping about from one aspect of that idea to another until its possibilities were exhausted. He challenged the audience to follow his train of thought, turn their assumptions upside down, expose the illogic of official logic, and use its rhetoric to destroy itself. Hendra goes on to write, the free form approach to what was on the audience's mind had much in common with a similar movement in jazz. Saul's method was to establish a theme as a jazz musician did, and then ring changes on it, wringing every possible phrase or comment out of its inherent ins absurdity. I'm sorry. Saul's method was to establish a theme as a jazz musician did, and then ring changes on it. Bringing, bringing every possible phrase or comment out of its inherent absurdity until the possibilities were exhausted, very much the same way that a jazz soloist would handle a solo. It was natural that both jazz musicians and audiences would feel at home with his method. Saul's only prop on stage was a newspaper, which he would use as a starting point for many of his riffs, and also as a kind of continuity device in hopping about from one subject to another. Jazz friends like David Brubeck used to refer to the ubiquitous newspaper as his axe. What Saul was quoted as saying, one of the great tools comedians don't use is the English language. Saul was obsessed with language and concepts. He delighted in banging them together in unexpected ways, juggling them, almost dropping them, but always reaching a happy conclusion. Implicit throughout his work is a fury that certain terms are being used to make people feel comfortable with ideas that should be questioned. Well, of course, you know, many of the terms that arose from um, nuclear holocausts and such. Uh, this is, of course, a preoccupation of George Orwell's as well, I might hasten to add, as a sort of footnote to Tony Henry's account of what motivated the satire of Morsal. Implicit throughout his work is a fury that certain terms are being used to make people feel comfortable with ideas that should be questioned. July 5th, 1955, The Compass, a Chicago performance troupe, featured a living newspaper which had performers taking news items from the day's paper and on top of rendering them as playlists improvising scenes on suggestions from the audience. It's not well remembered, but prior to the mid-50s, uh, there was really no such thing as an improv troupe, per se. And um, although Boston would like to claim the credit for having created this, or New York, much like Boston claims the credit for having invented vaudeville, or at least the American version of vaudeville, as a matter of fact, improv seems to have gotten its start in, of all places, Chicago, and furthermore to have branched out to New York City and San Francisco. It's only in uh, the 70s and 80s that improv really got any, uh, any significant foothold in Boston. Uh, of course, Boston was a bastion of the folk music scene. Uh, Tony Hendra talks about uh, the phenomenon of the sick jokes of the 50s and links them to the gross jokes of the 80s as chronicled in the books entitled Truly Gross Jokes, which in fact is up to its 16th volume. I in fact have some volumes of this particular uh, series of works. Truly tasteless jokes, gross jokes, call them what you will. Far from the sick jokes of the 50s, where it's which could at least claim to some vestigially bohemian purpose, the late 70s gross jokes simply affirm brutality and sensitivity and racism. The jokes are of not against a thuggish collective mind. They might make Rambo laugh, but not Rambo. A rather clever turn of phrase there. So let's talk a little bit about Bob Newhart as we promised to do earlier in this presentation. Tony Hendra states, Bob Newhart's version of outrage might appear to have been more a case of mild irritation than true satire, but the force of his comedy was enhanced by the anonymous middle everything manner with which it was delivered. In his routines, Newhart appears as a cog in someone else's machine, 
a nameless executive or functionary from some invisible corporate nowhere, the flat voice of the middle echelon. This persona struck a deep chord at the time and ultimately took him further than almost all his contemporaries. Now, <clears throat> Bob Newhart, of course, uh, was able to ride the wave of the uh, rise of the comedy LP that I discussed earlier. The button-down mind of Bob Newhart stood in its uh, debut in 1961 in the same in the same light as Inside Shelley Berman stood in the late 50s. Um, that is to say, Inside Shelley Berman and the button-down mind of Bob Newhart were uh, the first albums of two seminal comedians of the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, <clears throat> of course, eventually, uh, Bob Newhart was supplanted by the Smothers Brothers, Alan Sherman, Bill Cosby, Woody Allen, people like that. And Henry states, What Woody Allen and Bill Cosby had in common was that, unlike the premise-oriented routine of their early 60s counterparts, their comedy tended to center on themselves. This inward-looking comedy was not altogether new, but in combination with sophisticated attitudes, it broke new ground. A yearning for some kind of innocence, regression to the simpler concerns of childhood. Of course, this is after the Kennedy assassination, as Hendra takes great pains to point out. From, that, from this time on, growing up childhood and adolescence became ever-growing elements in boomer humor. Now, Hendra cites a fellow named Hesseman about the medium of improvisation. The magic thing about improvisation is that you and another go on stage with our own realities and create a third one with far greater possibilities, both for the two of us and everyone who witnesses it. And once again, we're getting to that old, old device of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis the tearing apart and the joining together, which has been a light motif throughout this presentation, which of course is concerns itself with humor and comedy in the American tradition. And speaking of dichotomies, there always seems to be something of a dichotomous impulse behind, um, behind comedy genres. In other words, for every Lenny Bruce, there is um, a Don Rickles who takes the same thing and make, renders it palatable to a mainstream audience. And Henry discusses Laugh-In in this light, the show Laugh-In, which you may have seen in repeats or may have actually, you may actually be old enough to have seen this program and that that the Smothers Brothers, Smothers Brothers put out. Some background here. Some of those brothers, of course, were uh, um, criticized for their um, anti-Vietnam War stance and were eventually yanked off the air by CBS as a result of it. Laugh-In presented the new generation of a collection of lovable kooks who expressed their freedom in a variety of weird ways, but who beneath the anarchy were just a harmless bunch of young folks out for a good time. The Smothers brothers presented themselves as apparently harmless young folks apparently out just for a good time, but beneath whose normal exterior lay some very weird ideas, if not outright dangerous convictions. But Laffin actually began to prepare the ground for the Smothers' subsequent internment. internment. Just as Saturday Night Live would later do to the National Lampoon, they robbed the Smothers brothers of their uniqueness. Of course, nowadays, uh, Laugh-In looks very dated. Um, Saturday Night Live had, had as its uh, initial credo, not the avoidance of the type of humor that was utilized in programs like The Smothers Brothers or Laugh-In. In fact, the bet noir, the evil opposite of Saturday Night Live was, at least to the people writing the show, um, the Carol Burnett show, and I, I must say I agree with them there, uh, although Carol Burnett is very knowledgeable about what she does, I don't particularly care for the type of comedy that she disseminates. 
Tony Henry writes about the National Lampoon, which he claims, of course, was seminal to Saturday Night Live by way of the stage review Lemmings and the National Lampoon Radio Hour, which, of course, brought John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd into the fold. We spoke, they spoke their various um, media saturated, saturated and post indoctrinated dialects and dial in, in a practically infinite number of mixtures in imitation mimicry with intent to kill. This was not a parody language, but a language made up of parody. Dozens of parodies of all the uses to which language is put in our culture, all the tricks it is trained to perform. Andrew talks a little bit about the brainstorm techniques that the writers at the National Lampoon use and says something very pertinent. Brainstorming. Five is fine. Six gets hard to follow. Seven is too many. Identical numbers, oddly enough, hold in the casting of a review. So all of you folks who are planning on casting a comedic review, keep this in mind. Five is fine. Six is hard to follow. And seven is too many. Now, Animal House talks a little bit about the film Animal House and uh, says that it has as its credos the uh, revealing the hidden underside of the 1960s prior to the Kennedy assassination, namely conformity, corruption at the top, the sanity of insanity versus psychotic normality, sexual freedom, contempt for the military, education versus growing up American, Official manipulation of stereotypes, self-criticism, the redeeming ability to be hardest on your own. Now, um, you may not have seen all of these things when you initially viewed the film, but um, Hendra makes a point that the film was actually an outgrowth of their 1964 high school yearbook parody, and some of the same characters carry over into the film. Strangely enough, the 1964 high school yearbook parody uh, has its seniors graduating in 1964 from high school, but Animal House has its freshmen going to college in 1963, which is kind of odd. Claiming that the process of reworking the past serves the cultural way is specious. That is to say, insofar as Hollywood films and television utilize this uh, process of re reworking the past and claim that they are actually surfing the cultural wave. In fact, no enterprise that sets out to share its ideals and feelings with it, an audience is ever at its mercy. It must please them, but it can't help leading them, even if it leads them into familiar paths. He's really talking basically about the, um, the Hollywood disease of only doing what is tried and true. He has some rather devastating things to say about people who dismiss the satirical impulse as merely childish or, at best, anarchic. The attitude that comedy is the way you express yourself before you know how the world works not only patronizes the young, but seeks to define all comedy, including satire, as childish. The voice of power seeking to devalue and defuse those who have its absurdities down. He talks about the latter day um, Saturday Night Live, which is to say the 80s and um, I guess by extension 90s version, even though he's writing in 1987. Talks about the over reliance of, uh, of impressionists such as Joe Piscopo and um, um, Billy Crystal. Impressions are parasitic unless they go further. Unless they go further, they simply they become simply a debasement of the recognition factor that exists in all humor. And let's talk a little bit about this recognition factor that exists in all humor. Without an audience able to recognize what you are talking about, humor gives way to mere bafflement. And bafflement, of course, is not conducive to Buffalo yucks. And so, even in the most sophisticated satires, you have to somehow draw a link with your audience which enables them to comprehend 
the ground from which you are starting. Now, a lot of people take the cheap and easy way out and refer to things that are on television, which they assume, probably rightly, their audience is intimately familiar with, having been exposed to it innumerable times. However, you are not doing anybody any favors by merely parroting back the dominant uh, culture's own uh, relentlessly repeated propaganda. And that is not what constitutes satire. In other words, getting up there and mocking commercials is merely doing the work of commercials for them in a medium which ordinarily they might not be able to penetrate, i.e. that of live performance. And so one must resist the impulse to stick to relatively safe material, which of course is incredibly incurably trite, e.g. Uh, Gilligan's Island parodies and the like, Star Trek parodies, um, and they have a number of uh, cliched, trite concepts. Hendreth has another way of putting this. Perhaps the public has so bought the concepts of celebrity and TV that imitation of celebrity fulfills the need for attacking authority that eternal wellspring of satire. Celebrity, as it exists in television, is authority. So by television standards, this is satire. If so, the doors are now closing rapidly on the world outside. The only targets of modern humor permitted are those that television has already created or approved or, in some cases, buried. And so this leads us to a problem, the new comedy. What will it be? What will it constitute? Boomer humor, as uh, Hendra makes a great point of stating, had very little to do with television. If you look through the first 50 or so issues of the National Lampoon, you won't find an awful lot of references to television. Um, because, as um, Hendra takes great pains to assert, television is inimical to satire. He goes on to even more devastating effect to say, humor is safely corralled in comedy clubs, mere audition halls for television. The appalling stand-up tell-a-joke form, which was already old hat in the days of Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce, in which they already um, were attacking and ridiculing as part of the old school, the reason their assembly line jokes stick to Gilligan's Island reruns and how not to make a left turn when driving down to the Safeway is because they want that Showtime special. Again, uh, Hendred is writing in 1987, before the comedy boom of the mid-80s to late-80s had dissipated. Not everyone likes humor with teeth, he concludes. There are as many audiences for humor as there are for music. Humor has its easy listeners and its hard rockers, but it doesn't follow that they are catered to. In fact, generalizing the audience, all people are tired of one kind of humor, tends to justify the production of only one kind of humor, and it's easy listening every time. The drive toward orthodoxy is palpable. Let's talk just a little bit about that before, well, before we are forced to bring this particular presentation to its perhaps sadly inevitable conclusion. The drive towards orthodoxy and humor as palpable, it, um, it is a sad fact of life that uh, the um, improv troops and the nightclub comedians of the 50s spoke to audiences who may have numbered no more than 25, 50, 100, um, and yet they, and because of this, they were able to, um, to transgress the boundaries which today are firmly enforced by mass communication. Um, of course, I'm operating on television, but it's cable television. In fact, cable television is about as close to the old style stage of the 50s with an audience of anywhere from 25 to 200 um, as we are going to get nowadays. So. Um, if I am on television, at least I am narrow casting. I am merely one of dozens of available channels, and I 
do not pretend to believe that I am reaching hundreds of thousands of people or even thousands of people or for that matter even hundreds of people although perhaps someday I shall um, now I'm not saying that great popularity is equivalent to blandness but inevitably television does force people into certain um, narrowly prescribed topic matters and those who are able to somehow transcend those limitations are of course um, those who are able to transcend the medium of television and ply their trade elsewhere. Um, I, I ran an open mic for many years, a comedy open mic for a couple of those years, and um, I, I found that uh, the ones who kept coming back week after week uh, were of two kinds. Either they were so talented and were, so, were constantly coming up with so much new material that they had this ferocious drive to perform even if there was almost nobody in the audience and they were basically rehearsing their new material. And then of course there were the people who equated the number of performances they had under their belts with, um, they equated it with some measure of how good they were, when in fact it's not so much the number of performances, although that has a great deal to do with it, or even the number of successful performances, but it's the number of performances of original material that really matters. And even if the material doesn't get a laugh, if it's original and it's funny, then sooner or later it will find its audience. That is something I cannot, I cannot stress strongly enough to anybody who aspires to excel in this medium as opposed to merely um, make one's presence known. Anyhow, I'll conclude with some facts that I gleaned from a biography of Jim Thompson by Robert Polito entitled Savage Art. Uh, Polito also wrote an anthology, or he edited an anthology of Thompson's lost writings entitled Fireworks, which was a very enjoyable book. But this uh, 1995 biography has a great many pertinent things to say. Jim Thompson himself said, there are 32 ways to write a story, and I've used every one, but there is only one plot. Things are not as they seem. And that, of course, is uh, perhaps the uh, grand linkage between what I've been saying all along about the uh, writer going into the profession of writing because of some hidden hurt of a childhood long past, and and attempt to utilize writing to retain his sanity, to expunge that hurt, or at the very least to create and to create triumph out of adversity. And the source of that hurt can be, strictly speaking, roughly generalized as what Thompson states is, things are not as they seem. Childhood disillusionment, of course adult disillusionment is perhaps even more bitter than childhood disillusionment because the adult knows that once he's reached a point where he's become disillusioned, it's probably too late to change it, whereas the child doesn't realize that this disillusionment will only intensify as he or she grows older. But Thompson's dicta is also perhaps one that one should keep in mind um, in the writing of satire, things are not as they seem. Well, I certainly had a lot of fun doing this series, and of course next week will be the final um, presentation of the series. I was afraid I was going to run out of material, but if everything, if anything, it's working out extremely well, and I've gotten to discuss probably roughly 98% of everything I've wanted to discuss, so I don't think any supplementary um, presentations will be necessary. Let me just quote one final thing, and uh, it was a surprising revelation to me um, when I read this. Uh, again, this is Robert Polito in the biography of Jim Thompson. He states early in his book that most crime novels tend to borrow their trajectory from, for all the obvious differences, classic comedy. Crime novels, 
classic comedy. A demonic impulse, greed, lust, jealousy, rage, and a calamitous action, murder, hurl a personality and a society to the rim of annihilation before the crime is solved, the impulse contained, the personality reintegrated, and the society allowed to resume its harmonious mission. In other words, things are messed up and someone comes back in to repair them. Or product-related crisis, product introduction, crisis resolution. A tripartite structure which perhaps lies at the basis of all creative endeavors. Crisis, solution introduction, crisis resolution. Of course, even when you defy this formula, you're still merely performing a variation of it. Well, I'm the wrong hero, and uh, I suppose in the waning moments of this presentation, I could say a little something about my background in comedy. In 1975, directly inspired, incidentally, by the National Lampoon and the National Lampoon Radio Hour, I was a part of a comedic troupe which broadcast over the radio in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, but for, and then when I went to college, I attempted to get on the staff of a humor magazine, which I will not name, but failed, and more or less deserted comedy for years, although retaining it in other forms of creative writing. Now I'm back. Tune in next week for the conclusion.